Thank you so much, Jamie and Sarah, and welcome to everyone. Such a, such a gift to be here with you and an honor. Um, I wanted to just start by offering us all the opportunity to um, close your eyes if it feels comfortable and relaxing to you, or you can just gaze softly downwards and just be present with three breaths. And I wanna offer my gratitude to my teachers and to the lineages that I've been so lucky to learn from that come from many cultures around the world, much from India and from across Asia, some from indigenous cultures. And these teachings have really helped me to tap into my inner wisdom, my, my internal guidance system. And I hope that they will be the same for you, that they will be a spark that brings you to your internal wisdom as well. So just contacting any gratitude that you would like to contact inside yourself right now. And touch in on what it is that brought you here. And when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes, come on back. And we'll be doing this on and off throughout the practice today. So just to give you an orientation, first of all, I wanna encourage everyone to make yourselves physically comfortable as much as is possible. And I invite you to choose a posture that helps you to be upright, but really supports you in balancing relaxation and alertness. And I'm gonna talk a little bit first on our topic, which is finding ground within unpredictability. Um, and I'm gonna offer three simple tools that can help us do that. Um, and then we'll go into some guided art observation meditation with Aphrodite's work. Um, you'll need a journal and something to write with or a piece of paper, any, any scrap of paper will do. Um, and at the end, I just wanted to mention as well that I'm happy to stick around if anyone has any questions. So our topic, again, is finding ground within unpredictability. And I really have found for myself, and I'm sure it's true for perhaps all of us, that um, we've learned a thing or two about unpredictability this past year of the pandemic. So I wanted to start with a, a sort of a light experience of that in our bodies today, just remembering that feeling that I think we all know of groundlessness. Um, and then we'll move into a, an experience that supports feeling grounded um, and relaxed. And after that, we'll deepen into the mindful observation, which will extend that relaxation for all of us. And um, really taking up Aphrodite on the offering that she has pre presented to us that this work is something that can be used to cope and recreate. So I want you to just think of to begin with a recent time when either you had a plan that didn't work out or for some reason it was hard to make a plan. And just jot that down. So don't go for anything too hard, nothing traumatic, nothing, nothing too hard, just a bearable instance of uncertainty that you have recently experienced. And throughout any time that I ask a question, we'll also be repeating the questions in the chat. So if you're thinking, oh wait, what was that? It's there for you in the chat box as well. So now you can go ahead when you're ready to 
Again, close your eyes if it is relaxing for you. If it's not relaxing for you to close your eyes, you can just gaze downwards and go into a more internal space. And notice your connection to the ground right now. Feel how your body is connected to the ground, either through your feet, through your seat. And notice that your breath is here with you constantly coming in and out. And now think of that time that you jotted down when you were unable to come up with a plan or your plan didn't work out. And just notice what you feel in your body. Breathing, staying connected to the ground and noticing what's coming through your body. And then when you're ready, if you have a, a few words to describe what that was like, you can open your eyes, come back, and if you feel like it, you can drop those words into the chat. Just, just a couple words describing what that was like for you. Yeah, tears, relaxation, anxious, tight, unsettled, disappointed, worried, longing, annoyed, trying not to be tense, wonderful. Yeah, so this is some of what it can be like for us. When we experience unpredictability, it can produce these feelings, I'm in control, that's interesting, stressed, focused, nervous. So there's so many different types of feelings that can come up for us when we do experience unpredictability. It can really create this anxiousness or this, this kind of groundlessness, this helplessness. It's unpleasant. So this particular moment in history, I think has amplified what was already the human condition for, for all of us, which is that we cannot ever know what is coming and that is uncomfortable. The unknown is, is inherently um, uncomfortable and anxiety producing for all of us. So the question um, that we're here to contemplate together is what do we do? How can we, how can we teach ourselves to relax with that and to find the ground again when we remember that there isn't ever any certainty um, other than change, of course. So I want to suggest that it actually may be somewhat simpler than we often think to, to be able to find the ground and to be present within unpredictability and uncertainty. And I'd like to introduce um, three simple tools that have been a bit of an antidote for, for me in these times. And um, I hope they can help. So these are three things that are always accessible. You don't need anything to be able to do them. Um, and they can help us to relax a bit. So the first one we already just did together, which is focus on connecting to the ground. So the ground itself, just take a moment here and now, you can close your eyes again if that supports you to feel your connection to the ground. So maybe you're, you're feeling that in your feet, in your legs, in your seat. bringing your attention 
to that connection, to that contact. What do you notice about that? If you'd like, you can jot down what you're noticing. You can certainly drop it in the chat or you can just feel it for yourself. Just keep your attention there on what you notice when you connect yourself to the ground. So that contact is actually always there for us, right? Gravity is always there for us, keeping us connected to the ground. And in fact, the weight of our bodies is creating this deep pressure in our joints as we press against the ground. And that naturally is regulating to the nervous system when we bring our consciousness to it, when we bring our awareness to it. So anytime we can choose to cons consciously bring the, the light of our awareness back to that experience of being grounded, and it actually helps us to feel grounded. Yeah, beautiful things people are saying. Shoulders relaxing, I feel centered, I feel stability, presence. And if that's not your experience, that's okay too. There are other ways. So the second thing I'd like to introduce is actually a, a self-compassion practice. And interestingly, when I was putting this together, I was initially going to talk about the breath as the second one and the constant nature of the breath. And then I realized, you know, that is true. It is totally centering and grounding to focus on the breath. And sometimes it can be the opposite um, to focus on the breath. I know for me and for a lot of the people that I've worked with, sometimes the breath can be anxiety producing. So I want to talk actually about self-compassion as an antidote for unpredictability. So if you're like me at all, you might be thinking, I don't, I don't have time for self-compassion. I have real problems that I have to sort out and take care of. <laughs> Um, or, you know, fix in myself, or, you know, maybe self compassion is never really going to work for me. Or that sounds hard. I just don't even really know how to do self compassion. How, where would I begin? Um, or I don't deserve it. There's all these things that come up around self compassion. I know for me for a long time, it really was like that. I didn't think it was something I could prioritize. And I didn't see why. Um, and then I started bit by bit listening to a lot of, there's so many amazing teachings available now on self-compassion. In particular, the teachings of Dr. Kristen Neff, who is a psychologist and researcher um, who is considered the foremost expert on self-compassion. And I realized that what she was presenting was actually really a simple practice that can be revolutionary. Um, it's for me kind of been like a, like a special sauce, like a, a key, a universal key that kind of opens up all the, you know, any of the, the hard things that I might seek support with adding self-compassion has really boosted it for me. It enables us to tolerate, um, whatever is present, whatever is going on. And for me, has made me feel like I'm tolerating it in a way that I'm not alone, actually, even though I am. Dr. Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F. -F. So let's try. So again, you can close your eyes if you'd like, or just go into your internal space, your private inner space and bring into your memory that thing that you first jotted down, that time when you, your plan fell through or you were having a really hard time coming up with a plan. You can see if you can access those feelings again. And then the first thing to do is just place a hand on your chest, place a hand on your heart. And just notice that. 
What is that like? What does that do? Just having that contact, that warm presence. And then you can say to yourself, this is hard right now. This is hard right now. This experience is hard right now. And notice what that happens, what happens when you direct that compassionate voice towards the hard feelings inside yourself. And again, you can jot it down if you'd like, you can share with us, or you can just keep it for yourself. Just noticing that. And the third practice I'd like to share with you is really simple, really profound one. Um, looking, looking. So it turns out that looking itself actually regulates the nervous system. And when I say regulates the nervous system, if you're not familiar with what that means, it means that it brings into balance the fight flight element that gives us our energy to stand up and move around and the rest, digest and heal element of our nervous system that helps us to relax. We want those in balance. And when sometimes one is too high or too low, and that's when you get into something like frozenness, depression, or you get into anger or needing to flee. So looking itself actually helps us to regulate and balance the nervous system. There's a healing field called somatic experiencing that calls this practice orienting. And you can, again, you can do this anywhere, anytime. Our visual perception is hardwired into our safety monitoring system, the nervous system. So the simple act of focused looking actually produces physiological impact. It slows the respiration and heart rates. It balances the nervous system and it secures us in our sense of safety in the here and now. And I find that consciously focusing my eyes is sometimes what it requires. Um, if I'm lost in thought or restlessness or worry, I find that even though I'm here, sometimes my focus of my eyes goes soft. I'm just not really looking at what's, what's here and now in front of me. And if I do that, then I don't feel really present. But if I bring, if I remember and I bring myself back, as soon as I realize I can consciously focus my eyes and um, it brings me into feeling present and grounded. So again, let's try this. And there's a question, does it matter what we look at? No, it doesn't. I recommend you look at a stable, unmoving object. So just look around your room right now. Find a stable, unmoving object and just consciously focus your eyes on it. Mindfully focus your eyes. You can even just scan around the room looking at different objects. You're noticing with curiosity the textures and the light and the dark and the lines. Just taking it in with kind of a, a lot of interest, a lot of curiosity. And notice how you feel while you're doing this. Yeah, and you can share it with us, you can jot it down, or you can keep it for yourself. What is it like? How do you feel when you mindfully, consciously focus on looking? Calm, steady, beautiful. safe. Yeah. Thank you. 
And again, if any one of these isn't the one for you, there may be another one. Um, so we can always keep trying, keep looking. There are, these are just a few, so many different ways to feel grounded and um, your internal wisdom can guide you there anytime you ask yourself as well, what, what would help me to feel grounded right now? With all of these, the common thread is that they really are easily accessible anytime, anywhere. But to get the medicine out of them, we have to choose consciously to do it. We have to apply them with the intent to find the ground. Um, and so if you're like me, you might feel anxious and think, but I'll never remember. What if I never remember to do that? So just setting the intention to remember is big and really appreciating yourself anytime that you do. It helps rewire us. My teacher Tara Brock says, mindfulness really is about forgetting and remembering and forgetting and remembering and forgetting and remembering. And the aspiration to remember really does help a lot. So I invite you to um, apply aspiration right now that you remember. And for the second half of this experience together, some of these I will be um, reminding you as we go. And I just invite you to remind yourself and notice if that remembering happens naturally for you and then celebrate it when it does. So let's take this looking experience to the art realm and use some of these amazing ink paintings that Aphro Aphrodite Navab uh, created and provided by the Addison. So we're gonna look at three, starting with this one. Thank you, Jamie. So I'm gonna guide you in mindfulness all the way. And there will also be some written reflection as we go. Um, the invitation is also there. If you don't enjoy written reflection, you can just replace that. You can replace it with drawing. You can replace it with movement, sound. Obviously, keep yourself muted. But if you want to be in your own space making funny sounds, go for it or beautiful sounds. Um, and you can just do internal contemplation as well. So no pressure to do written, uh, whatever way of processing you prefer. So taking a look at this image now, just let yourself really focus your eyes on this. Let your eyes move all around. Trusting your eyes. Allowing your eyes to linger wherever they want to for as long as they want to and move on whenever they feel like moving on, whenever something catches your attention, your curiosity. Let your breath be with you consciously while you look. Notice your body touching the ground while you look. And notice if your eyes want to go back and forth between taking this in as a whole and focusing on specific parts. Just notice when that's happening. And now close your eyes or gaze downwards. So taking your attention away from the image Going back into your internal space.
relaxing into the breath, into the body. If thoughts come, let them be welcome and let them move on, not taking you over. They're just a part of this multi-layered experience you're having. If emotion is here, certain energy is here, attempting just to observe it. Let it be welcome, let it be a part of everything that you're experiencing. And then notice in your mind's eye, bring the image back to with your eyes closed or looking down, coming back to that ink painting. Soft breath. What do you notice about the image? See if you can feel yourself lightly holding it inside. No need to reach or strain, just light effort to recall the image. And whatever remains is here for you. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and come back to looking again. And what do you notice now? Relaxing the body as you look. Always welcome to stretch and move the body as you look. Again, not straining, not straining to stay, just offering to stay for a few moments. And then jot down a few words to describe your experience. What stands out for you here? What did you notice? Maybe three words. Welcome to share them in the chat or keep them for yourself. The inner circle is the top of the mountain that we climb for peace. Beautiful. So others noticing things may be different. Maybe there's overlap. Tornado spinning vortex. Lovely. Hmm. Contrast, light and dark, hope and despair, cycle of life, whirlpool, flower, my home is myself. Holding, hugging, happy, navel, wound, labyrinth, nest of comfort, birth canal, stay in the light. Beautiful poem we're writing. Yeah. Thank you.
Let's bring an image to Jamie. A new one. So again, just noticing what's here, trusting your eyes and exploring, exploring, trusting that you know how to look, you know how to learn what's here and what's important for you. Feeling connected to the ground as you look. And to breath. Is it possible to give yourself fully to this painting and at the same time, give yourself fully to yourself. So really noticing what's here inside what you see and inside yourself, balancing the internal and the external. You can close your eyes. Go into that internal space. You can bring the image with you. And open your eyes again. Back to looking. Close the eyes. Relaxing into your internal space. Gently inviting the image to be present with you inside. And I'm gonna ask a question while you're here with yourself internally. How are you feeling at this time in your life? How are you feeling at this time in your life? You're welcome to to write down, if you want to write something down, you can just stay with your eyes closed, feeling into how you're feeling. Might be words, it might not be words. And then come back to looking again at the image. What do you notice? Just focusing the eyes on looking. Just kind of a languid, loving looking. Let yourself go where you love it, where you love what you see. And then come inwards again with your eyes closed. Softening, softening the breath and the body. Here with yourself as much as you can. If it's hard to be with yourself, that's what's here too. Be with that. That's okay. Noticing what's happening on the inside. And again, I'm gonna ask the same question. How are you feeling at this time in your life?
What's the next layer? Just noticing. And come back looking again when you're ready. Back to the image. Notice what's here, what's here for you. What's here for you in the image? Has it shifted? And one last time, we'll close our eyes again. This time, maybe you bring a hand to your heart if it feels right. No worries if that doesn't feel authentic for you. You could make contact with yourself in another way. Ah. How are you feeling at this time in your life? What's here for you? Just let it come to you. No straining, no effort. Just a gentle effort. More like that. Gentle effort. What's here for you? And you can come on back to looking again at this image. Notice what you see. Notice how this has evolved for you over the time of looking. And then feel free to share in the chat anything or jot down anything that you have experienced in this little experiment that you'd like to share. And we'll go on to the third image as well. If you still want to share from the last one, go for it. Mm. So taking in this again, trusting your eyes, trusting this looking. See if any of those tools, those grounding tools are present for you. Is there a problem with my microphone? Can you hear okay? Okay, great. Someone said the microphone, so I just wasn't sure. Maybe that's something you're seeing in there. Um, so as we look, okay, great. I'm glad you're hearing me okay. As we look, relaxing, allowing whatever is coming up to be perfectly welcome as much as this is possible. And then come back into your internal connection again. So we're really balancing here the internal with the external. This is a practice as well that can be helpful. To 
So scanning through the body. Noticing the quality of the breath. Welcoming emotional energy. Being open to thoughts that come and go. Being open to the continual shifting the endlessly shifting nature of experience. The question, what connects you with trust in your life? What connects you with trust in your life? And you can come to the image with that question. Looking wondering again not straining to know something that might be unknowable but just coming with a gentle question holding it like in an open palm rather than a closed fist what connects you with trust in your life And is there a connection in what you see here and what you feel inside and know inside? Is there a way that what you see reflects your knowing, your internal guidance system? So one last moment to look to go into your internal looking as well. And we'll offer some gratitude if you have a naturally occurring gratitude and you can use whatever type of gesture feels authentic and true for you, a gesture of, of gratitude towards these works of art, which have so much to offer us and the intimacy of your experience with them. And I'd like to offer a few moments of opportunity um, before we open the floor to Aphrodite to share with us about some of what these have meant for her or why you made these maybe what they meant for you. Um, to 
offer the floor to any of you who are here. If anyone would like to raise your hand, we'll have space for a few people to say something if you'd like to speak. Um, you're also welcome to jot down into the chat. Um, and of course, there's no pressure ever to share. This is very personal, of course. You, you've, you're, you've been through an experience where you're in your inner world and you're reflecting on your life. So of course you may not wanna share that, which is absolutely um, fine. And if you do feel called to say something and be heard um, in this space, you, you are welcome. So anyone, and I'm not sure, will I see if you raise your hand, go ahead. If anyone would like to share something that they experienced here, any reflections? Thank you. I've experienced that I must take time for myself in order to recenter so that I may be the best version of myself. Yeah, me too. center is like a beginning and the spiral is the energy emanating from that center outwards it's not a smooth path but ongoing thank you so much i always find that there's incredible poetry in the words that people find after experiences of mindful looking it's just so moving to me. So if no one else wants to speak or share, that's wonderfully fine. And maybe we can give some space, Aphrodite, if you'd like to share with us. Um, first of all, I'm very, very honored and grateful that this is happening and you're here and you're attending to these works that started off very concrete and deeply personal and visceral and sensory based and family. So I, I took it from the soul and I, I abstracted it. So this is now I am looking like a visitor and a stranger at my works, um, which keep on making meaning and they, they're growing, they're becoming different works now that they're touching uh, more people and I'm seeing words and reactions and this is very moving to me. Um, it is a monument to my brother, Alexander Navab, who passed away uh, of sudden cardiac death two years ago, only 53 years old. and. He wasn't just a brother, he was my best friend. And I think he taught me what unconditional love was before I could say it in any language. At that time, my first language was Farsi. So before I could say esh, he showed me what esh was. And this kind of showing, I think, I feel it's in my work because I take the, the concrete and the visceral and I turned it into from the personal to something that could be universal because I abstracted it. It's not a day in the life of me and my love for my brother, but it is a testament to it now. It's a monument and it's something 
it's something universal enough and open enough that people can come and access it from whatever avenue and road and time and life. And so it's, to me, it, the, it could be anything. It starts with this idea of the landmine, um, which can be explosive and carry histories of war and pain and suffering, but at the same time, um, the, the message of the work as a whole is about healing communally and starting from the personal and reaching out. And this whole thing about memory and um, inciting consciousness and present, being present and being here uh, is very much what this physical work asks, asked of me in the first place as I was doing the artist in residency at, um, uh, at Andover and Addison Gallery of American Art. It basically became a whole experiment and experience of what you're doing right now. I did it solitary. It was my own mindfulness meditation. It was also my own ritual uh, with ink, with brush, with water, with paper, erasing, rewriting, um, making. And for me, the drawing act, it could be different things for different people, but drawing for me has become a sort of thread through this labyrinth that allows me to engage and, and, and engage and, and deal with and mine um, my demons and my heroes and my history and my past, but it also is that thread like in the labyrinth that allows me to escape or reemerge from the uh, submersion. So for me, it's it, yes, it's about loss, but it's also about healing. It's about incredible pain, but it's also about incredible joy at being given the opportunity to share. It's also about loving tenderly someone very specific, but turning it into something metaphorical and poetic and bringing in Greek and Persian um, mythology and folklore as for me, like the thread of memory is your way out of the line, landmines to step gingerly around them and not lose, lose yourself. So in a sense it is, I did lose myself in the making of the work uh, only to come out again a little bit, a little bit stronger, a little bit, a little bit, how do I say, able to face a present and then a future with that same string. And for me, that string was um, drawing, ink drawing, which is so fluid. So I loved reading what people were saying about these, these labors of love of mine. They're like, because I, I, I was looking at them like a parent looks at a kid. I look at my daughter and son this way, both Shazad and Bijan. When I look at my 25 year old daughter or my 15 year old son, I'm like, they are independent. They came from me, they came through me, and a lot of love. And I did raise them by myself and with a community of amazing parents and siblings. But but they are independent from me and increasingly so as they become adults and, and they are works of art that really just keep growing. And for me, that's how I look at these works right now when, when, I'm, when I'm seeing them as an outsider, they came from me, but they are now part of the world and they are free and a gift and they are on their own making a journey. And now I see more, I'm looking at them and I can see the minotaur inside the labyrinth. I can see, you know, a soldier or a hero emerging from the center. I can see, I can see um, the navel. I can see the act of giving birth as such a, you know, it, it to me it's so synonymous with the giving forth these works uh, of art. So, anyways, I don't want to keep going, but I'm deeply moved by this this uh, communal kind of gathering.
Thank you so much. I don't know if you might have seen there was a question if you could talk about the birds and what they mean for you. Oh, so I haven't looked at the the last few texts, but so in um, in Persian folklore, I, I use two two very important stories in my life. So the labyrinth, the ancient Greek labyrinth uh, myth of the Minotaur in the center, and the um, the the Theseus finding his way out with Ariadne's string and not only destroying the monster that was eating people, <laughs> but also finding his way out. And there was a, it's a very complex myth and there's betrayal and who's the hero really? I mean, for me, I think Ariadne had a lot to do with um, being the storyteller and the hero. So there's another story going on through these works and it's the uh, Sangye Sabur uh, folklore, which is the patient stone, which is the, the Iranian um, version of the diary or the personal, extremely private uh, confessional. And instead, it's not written or recorded, that, which can be kind of kind of used against you. Um, it's, it's speaking to a stone, a stone that doesn't talk back, but a stone that takes, it's a mythical stone that really uh, absorbs all the confessions and the suffering and the pains and but in a um, sort of I for me uh, very very frightening um, you know dystopian way uh, explodes and creates death and destruction everywhere so the stone can only hold that much so when I was thinking of very personal things inspired by walking through the high school campus of my brother and losing him and then then meeting new people there and life and and coming across the bird sanctuary there and 11 stones that were in a circle like to me a very very primal kind of um uh monument all of these collided into the idea of well what if the stone uh, metamorphs and transforms into something that can kind of fly away and bring new life and carry the past with it, but into, um, you know, into healing and reinvention and rebirth. And I, I really, really just, it, the process of making and doing and being present with the work and with the ideas and with the materials, made me think of really for I, I haven't I have never thought of it before but bringing the labyrinth and the patient stone together and what happens well a bird can fly and emerge from all of that and you know through all of this um uh mixing and whirlpool of stories ideas thoughts feelings histories uh, myths uh, what emerges to me is hope. And in Greek, hope is elpida. And what I've read in, um, and in Persian, it's omid. And when I was thinking of just the poems that, that mean a lot to me, um, what is hope? You know, hope is feathered to me. Hope flies. Hope lifts you. Um, and I think that is why this bird was born. It was like a mixture of all of these intersections. I never came with a plan um, to have the, burn, the bird emerge as, uh, to me, the hero. I think that I, the more I think about it, uh, she's the hero. It could be Ariadne, it could be the little sister who, who is devoted and devoted memory and loving memory and you know, may his memory be eternal is what we say in Greek all the time. May his memory be eternal, eternal. And I'm like, well, you know, that bird is eternal. That bird is escaping the confines of whatever traps you in a landmine. And, and instead of exploding, I'm thinking of reinvention and rebirth and, and flight away from, you know, the, what's dragging you down, basically what either is gonna destroy you or can uh, recreate you. And that's basically, there was no linear way uh, for that. That happens through this descent into making and being and, and, and processing.
processing very real grief, but also um, really being present with the materials and the fact that I was in solitude doing my my artist residency. But then from that solitude of the of my personal um, space, I was always engaging with uh, the community and meeting students both at public high school and at Andover. And that that was this kind of you know, private, public engagement and solitary and communal that is basically the source of how Landmines of Memory now is, is there for the campus and for the public and now virtually for the internet, which to me is, it's, it's really the treasure. That, that is like the thread of drawing, the line, line to me, line can save you. <laughs> Um, literally, metaphorically, and in artistically, it's now that little line of that first drawing um, is now the line connecting all of us here and in a very virtual setting, you know. So it did start with that little intention and that little mark on the paper. Are there more questions? Or Yes, Emily Dickinson, you got that. That really touched me. I had read it in years ago. I came to this country in fourth grade and I think I read that in like eighth grade and I never forgot that. It really touched me. I was like, what does this mean? <laughs> there are a lot of seagulls where I live on Roosevelt Island, seagulls everywhere, everywhere. Mm and feathers everywhere. <laughs> I love that hope is feathered. That was such a beautiful thing that will stay with me. Thank you. I think it's your, sorry, Allison uh, Kemmerer, she, she wrote something really beautiful that I was like, wow. I, I wouldn't say it this way. It's like a hope is untethered, you know, that it basically uh, the works fly. And I really like that, the idea of untethering because so many things tether us, especially now the past 11 months in the pandemic. So many things are weighing us down and trapping us and isolating us either through voluntary quarantine or forced or just, just the very nature of what we've been going through this year. Can I mention something that's standing out to me, um, which is that, you know, it's really interesting right now on my screen is this image of the gallery where the art is all living. And it really got me thinking, I think especially Aphrodite, when you you talked about like people's engagement with the art and that that is like that whole interaction and experience is really what these, you know, um, non-living things are about, you know, that they gather their life and their significance through the ways that people live with them and understand them. But what's really standing out to me right now as we come together in this unusual online space is how much more welcoming it's been to the art to start off with these mindful exercises where we simply just tried to look at it. And then, you know, we had opportunities to try to ground ourselves and to do things. And frankly, like the sort of history of the museum experience is not that, you know, it's this sort of very stilted, you walk around, you may not touch anything, please don't talk, everything has to be quiet. And I, I just feel like this has opened up an experience with art that is very healthy for us to use it for mindfulness, but also has brought it alive in a way that I think historically museums kind of shut you down. And you also always worry like, do I really know what she was up to? And, you know, again, you feel like there's some right interpretation that eludes you because you don't have a background in art history or whatever. And truly, I loved hearing you tell the whole story of it. And really, you know, saying, oh, yeah, this is what, you know, she was thinking about. But it also felt very invitational to 
think about what we're getting from that, you know, that there wasn't like right answer to what you intended and we were all supposed to take that. So anyway, I think this unusual setup today is really creating a very dynamic experience that has not always been what I felt at museums. Um, and I love now there's gonna be a workshop where you're gonna let people do some hands-on things to become even further acquainted with you and your work and your process. So thank you. Thank you. That was thank Susan. You. Susan, that was Susan speaking, is that right? Um, yes, that was, yes. Yeah. So many participants. I was scrolling through trying to see who to look at. Um, because I'm so visual. I'm like, who, who is speaking? I hear the voice very clearly. So I, I appreciate that, Susan, so much. You know, I, at first, um, I, I had no idea this was going to happen. <laughs> so for me, this is a beautiful, one of those beautiful surprises. Um, and I'm deeply touched because, you know, I, I made this to give this to the world. And you never know what's, you don't do it because it's gonna be received either way, well or not. Is it gonna be accepted or rejected? You do it because you have to do it. For me, it's my, my way of, of living and breathing. Someone the other day said, art for you is like air. And it's true, I was thinking, some people write, some people walk, some people do this, do that. I, I, I make art to live and it is also, it's my living, my chosen profession, but it's, it's how I want to live. It's a way of being in the world. It's a way of asking questions. And there's so many ways you can ask questions of the world and, and process your history and the world itself. Um, so I, I can't live without making. And for me, making, making art is the way I live and breathe. And, and then when I, I give it and it becomes part of, other people's engagement and other people's stories. I'm so open to what their reactions are. I'm so excited to hear how much it's changing and growing, how much it's not what I even intended in the first place, but it's it's in that path that I'm even re-inspired by that tangent that it's going on because I don't own it. You know, this is something that I never really did own it. I feel like I've become open to a much larger um, way of being in the world and it's older than me and it's going to continue after me and 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 honestly this is going to be part of the permanent collection or already is of the Addison so when this goes down it's going to be it's going to be collected and stored and and preserved but then it's going to be brought out again it's going to be accessible a generation from now um, maybe my grandchildren I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it will keep making new meaning and cross generations and time and maybe inspire a whole new, um, a, a whole new world and a whole new set of circumstances. We're going through the worst pandemic <laughs> in our history right now. And I think nothing is an accident that, that the work is being shown right now. And it's next to Yoko Ono's installation, which is, but a privilege and an honor to be next to her and also how she has been living after her own trauma and grief and, and thinking about her installation and mine together as you know coming from a source of very private grief and personal and then becoming something much more abstract and communal and allowing, allowing viewers to walk through, touch, move, um, and do their own sort of, um, for me, it would have been more labyrinth, but because of COVID uh, restrictions, this is the meandering is the best way we can do, meandering through the works that stand in, in three-dimensional space. I, I wanted that and I'm very grateful to the museum for making this possible. I really wanted people to walk through and if they can visit the space, it's one of few museums really steadily open <laughs> throughout this time. And I think it's just, it's so important to go. It's not 2D, it's really 3D and it really is alive. 
walk through the space, you'll see more, you'll connect more. It'll be standing with you. Um, and I see them as testimonials, they're standing there. I even noticed it looked like a grieving procession and a lamentation. Um, but at the same time, no, it's also a memorial, a monument, and it, it's about giving life and new meaning and, and flying. I really love these birds and I haven't seen birds like these anywhere. <laughs> Some, there, there was a professor of um, uh, Iranian uh, contemporary art who was like, wow, I've never seen the labyrinth brought together with the patient stone, the Sengi Sabur. So people have talked about both extensively and each alone, but you know, it does take a, a, a mutt and a hybrid and a Greek Iranian who's mining her histories and heritages to bring it, you know, bring them together. So they're, 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 they're speaking to each other right now. They've transformed the labyrinth and the stone of patience to me are, are stones and structures that I ended up wanting um, to fly rather than, you know, get destroyed or destruct. So con construction is an important theme for me too. And, and yeah. Aphrodite, thank you so much for just all you're sharing with us and for how much you have, um, you know, shared this artwork as platform with us, that it's yours and ours to experience and to enrich each of our lives. And thank you to everyone for, um, for really bringing this into yourself. Um, this has been such a, a beautiful experience for me. I've learned so much from this looking and I hope that this has um, opened and brought some breath into your Sunday. And I'd love to invite anyone who's still here on the call to just end with a little sort of as we began reconnecting with yourself one last time with your breath and your body and looking for an authentic gesture of, of closure, whatever feels real for you. Thank you for giving yourself this time. Thank you for being here. Such a gift.